Hello everyone, greetings from the Seventh of Nero, AJ here, and this one's for newcomers to the world of Iron Kingdoms, Imoran, Cain, and Urcane, the setting of War Machine and Hordes. In essence, this video will hop around the digital Iron Kingdoms and the main War Machine factions with a tiny bit of history. Despite being a game with a pretty tight rule set and compelling characters, I often find myself wishing to know more about the world that the game I call love calls home, as well as the people and other things that populate it. And this series, well, the channel as a whole, I hope, serves as a mean for me to codify my reading and interpretation experience, I suppose, even if my biases within the game will become awfully clear awfully quickly. But hopefully not today, and I beg your forgiveness should there be any detail I recount incorrectly. Given the intended length of this piece and the sheer breadth of subject material, I'm sure that for newcomers each clarification will be maybe followed by a dozen sources of confusion, but I intend to give more comprehensive overviews in future series. Now, before the very recent coming of the Infernals, of which we were warned was but a taste of what they were capable of, there was a pleasant status quo, if you can call it that, of numerous struggles across Imoran, where, for the last few years and decades in, in some instances, which covers the time period of most immediate relevance to us, there had been a predictable tit-for-tat pushing and shoving in various contested regions. And this was particularly the case in the West, where most factions have their nations and capitals, or what passed for them. Indeed, a sizable proportion of factions don't even have a recognised homeland per se, and function as periodically settled or unsettled tribes, covert organisations or underground cults, allowing their presence to be as known or as secret as they so desire. But even they will have headquarters that serve as the focal points for their factions, or sub-factions, because a setting like this would be nothing without internal political squabbling. The Iron Kingdoms and its eponymous era came about in... 202 AR, by human reckoning, 202 years after the commencement of the Great Rebellions against the Orgoth, a human empire originating from beyond the oceans. From a little before 600 BR, or before the rebellion, they systematically destroyed, subdued, and subjugated each of the precursor kingdoms and empires of the Thousand Cities era, taking slaves and oppressing all they could, which came to encompass all humans in Western Imoran. Such was the threat that the Orgoth posed that Torak himself was disturbed enough to take direct action, personally destroying the Orgoth invasion fleet that took sail against Crix, sinking a Cetixis fleet on its way. Let us be clear, the dragons of Cain are not as the dragons of other dimensions who can be brought down by a singular mortal hero, however skilled, divinely blessed or knowledgeable in the arcane arts, and no amount of wishful thinking can or will help in doing so. No, such creatures as Torak and his brood are incomprehensible beings of unknown origins, though theories abound of a size that, that can dwarf a metropolis and nigh unkillable, for they can always create a new body around their athank, should their flesh be defeated. What you see now is Torak in a more approachable form. Nevertheless, in the face of Torak's ungodly strength, the Orgoth avoided Crix thereafter, content to leech from the, the Amoran mainland. To the east, no one truly knows why, but the Orgoth never pushed further towards the Bloodstone Desert, only once unsex unsuccessfully invading rule. Even so, after 200 years of futile resistance to these invaders, 400 more years of restless and miserable occupation, and another 200 years of bloody rebellion mounted by many different factions resulting in untold death and destruction, the Orgoth rule in Western Amoran was finally extinguished, but for ruins left behind and what remained of human civilization gathered to pick up the pieces. The result was the Corvus Treaties, which divided the human-occupied parts of the continent into four kingdoms, Signar, Cador, Ord, and Lael. Unsurprisingly, though, the peace after the defeat of the Orgoth would not last long, as human nature saw them find enemies amongst each other. The long-time protagonists of the setting, as of the modern era, and the main focus of much of the driving narrative is Signar, and they who fight for her. In better times, the kingdom of Signal was the pinnacle of human society and technology, but all things must come to an end, and it started with a civil war between Signal's Morrowin and Menite's religious communities, some 1700 years after the Church of Menoth recognised the Morrowin faith, even though Morrowins had come to be the majority belief amongst the people during the Orgoth occupation. Conflict concluded with the secession of the lands occupied by the followers of Menoth and the creation of the Protectorate in the arid lands to the south, with borders already established in the years of war between the two belligerents, but granted official and legal status in its aftermath. 
This divided not only the nation of Signar, but its capital, the eastern half across the Black River, renamed Sul, in honour of the Hierarch Solon, at whose declaration war came to Signar. Strife continued with Winter IV's paranoia-driven reign, helped along by his founding of the Inquisition, a reign that ended when he was deposed and replaced by his brother Leto. While the younger brother ascended to the throne, the elder fled into the desolate east. And since then, Signar has had to contend with the growing power of those who would bring the word of the lawgiver to all. To the north, and serving as a reluctant buffer, Ord lies sandwiched between Cador and Signar. And while they receive overtures of friendliness from their southern neighbours, the Ords know better than to trust them any more or less than their northern neighbours, no matter how appearances seem. Said northern neighbour, the Winter Kingdom, ruled from the Stasikov Palace at Korsk, has always wanted a better lot for themselves in their harsh climes, increasingly ambitious to rekindle the old days of the Cardic Empire, even, or perhaps especially, at the expense of those across their borders, whether those borders are agreed or imposed. Indeed, in recent times, they have approached this sought-after epoch and have become an empire once more, under the beloved and intelligent Ayn van Aar XI, whose statecraft belies her youth as compared to Leto of Signar and Baird of Ord. Anyone not a Cadoran would call her cruel and uncompromising for what she has done to benefit her nation. And not least because those gains have mostly come at the expense of Lael, who have spent these recent years fighting against the Cadoran occupation of much of their western lands, sometimes only able to look on as their towns and homes are filled with the muddy soldiers of other nations as they too struggle over the scraps of contested Laelese territories. How far they have fallen from when they were the urbane and cultured of the Iron Kingdoms. Off the coast of Signal, one would blunder, for few wish to willingly venture there, into the nightmare empire of Crix, nothing but reavers and raiders delighting in all things deathly and torturous. The islands of the Meredius are a foreboding place, no matter how you look at them. All goth ruins of the erstwhile fortress of Dracarang serve as a reminder of their creator's former presence, but what the Lich Lords raise to serve in their place is little better. Contrary to what their enemies would say, though, those that rule in Crix are a diligent, studious collection of minds, no less than their counterparts on the mainland, if not more so because there are few others to learn from, and their lives and deaths are contiguous phases of their existence. Knowing they have more time drives them to discover more about what their world can offer, even if it means harvesting a few bodies or reaping a few souls for their experiments and games. What are a few thousand deaths if it means arcane progress? It is merely renewal after all. Returning to the mainland, and the further east you venture once you pass Lael, the more alien things become. In the mountains dwell the rule with their clans, genial dwarves, ever diligent in their work and always industrious, not only in their craftsmanship, but also in making war. They have a care to keep war from reaching to within their borders, though, and even if clan rivalry can boil over into conflict from time to time, the great feud of ages is something they are quick to remind themselves of. Nonetheless, should a threat come from without, they are quick to take measures to protect their interests, because the safety and the security of the clan comes before all else. Though the dwarves answer to no king, the stone lords, the thirteen senior most clan leaders, serve as that nation's highest authority in all matters, secular and religious. To their southeast can be found those that consider the dwarves of rule the last of their mortal friends on Imoran. The elves of Ios, along with what remains of their Nis cousins after they were blighted and riven by Everblight's machinations. Into the lands beyond the Glimmerwood and the Bloodstone marches, few consciously wonder with the expectation of returning alive, the closing of their doors remembered by those few who know of when the, the elves turned the world away from them. The elves, like the dwarves, have no king or queen, bearing in a ruler's place the figurehead divine court, their gods, who roamed amongst them in days past, but are little more than a shadow now. With practical rule falling to the fane of Syrah and the consulate court, otherwise known as the Halitir, the high houses, the fifteen most powerful of Ios's nobility and their most esteemed representatives. As one, they look to the Iron Kingdoms in the west with growing disdain. And hidden amongst all of this is the convergence of Cyrus, who would only emerge to enact their great work in 606 AR upon the declaration by the constellation that Directrix should serve as the Convergence's leader. They recognise no borders and no greater power than the will of the Maiden of Gears, determined to enlighten the world in the wisdom of the harmonics and to bring machine-bound immortality to the faithful. Only a great upheaval would break these seemingly habits of centuries and ancient enmities, but we'll get to that some other time. 
Further out, over the, the Ios and peaks in the north and the lion's teeth and the Rotterhorn to the south, lies the bloodstone desert, within which nothing lives but the hardiest of beasts and the most desperate of men. The Iron Kingdoms have few things in common, but festering in many minds is the desire to have the means to dominate all the other kingdoms, denied though it may be by some of them. Signar fights its wars on so many fronts, many who serve her have forgotten why they fight in the first place, only that they do fight and wish it to end. The Protectorate enacts the will of the Lawgiver, even if it means burning the world to the ground. Cador sees all else as weaklings, undeserving of such freedoms, while Crixians have no qualms about life or death. The presence of one's body or soul is immaterial to service to the Dragon Father. And around them, the Laelis' resistance has fought for their country's freedom for so long their leaders know little else. And King Baird of Ord has nothing but schemes to ensure his nation's survival, surrounded by so many powerful neighbours as he is. Even the Ruluk, far less inclined to Warcraft than their human counterparts, have turned their machines of mining and industry to weapons of war. So far have they been dragged along by the conflicts of humans and beasts. All the while, the Iosans have deepened their resentment and contempt for the magic of mankind for the withering of god godly pantheon, seeking vengeance in the hope of their revival. The means by which they seek superiority find their focus in the same few facets amongst all the nations. The Warcaster gift and the fundamental technology of the Cortex. They may be manifested and nurtured and exploited in different ways, but the Warcasters of each realm are certainly exploited, make no mistake. And where they go to fight, the heavy steps of Warjacks surely follow them. Warjacks whose capabilities are never committed half-heartedly. These machines of war differ from nation to nation, whether they be the rare lumbering hulks of Kador, the horrid eldritch constructs of Crix, or the sleek white myrmidons of Ios, but their purpose is always the same. By the will of one with the Warcaster's gift that guides their actions to destroy their enemies without mercy or compunction. Even those of the lesser kingdoms and mercenary companies of various stripes obey the same commands, except against targets of flesh instead of targets of industry. For on occasion they go so far as to use long decommissioned warjacks or retrofit their modest labourjacks to carry weapons and whatever upgrades are at hand. When a machine, 12 foot tall and the better part of 10 tons of welded metal, belching acrid black smoke and an ominous glow in what passes for eyes, lumbers towards you wielding gun and sword, or even it's just its own fists, there is no elegance, there is no grace, there is only the faint hope that you do not die too messy a death. Even the Myrmidons, driven by the energy of ley lines instead of cold-fired furnaces, cannot bring any sophistication or dignity to battle, though many bear guns that no human could fathom. They bring down their foes and are brought down in return, with all the same brutality and indifference as their steam-driven equivalents. No matter what, when a battle finishes, warjacks all end it, either covered in viscera, whether organic or mechanical, or as a miserly pile of metal scrap to be scavenged by arcanists or mechanics. True, some warjacks develop what may charitably be considered to be a personality, and even a unique one, but it is never at odds with their purpose as a machine to bring death and destruction. The acceleration in what would eventually be an inevitable arms race brought back technology not seen or used in hundreds of years, a remnant of a terrifying time and artifice harkening back to the wars against the Orgoth, and thusly long considered excessive and dangerous, even by the most hawkish of war proponents. Nonetheless, in such machines, warjacks would see not their logical conclusions, for warjacks are a newer, and one might even say a more moderate creation. No, not their logical conclusion, but their logical extreme. Titanic machines of such rarity yet bearing enough power to sway the course of a battle decisively by themselves, they quickly attracted the attention of any strategist and tactician worth their salt, no matter who they answered to. Thirty feet and a hundred tons of unadulterated devastation, once these colossals return to the battlefields of Amoran, it would take a miracle or a catastrophe for them to disappear again. And this is to say nothing of the other forces in this world that announced their place and plans, for they would bring weapons of war, armies and magics that make the other powers really wonder at who their real enemies are. Beyond the Iron Kingdoms, and indeed even within them, lay perils that endanger human, dwarven and elven existence. Within the human nations are lands that none of their citizens would want to step foot in, that have been left desolate since before the Corvus Treaties, and this neglect would soon be more a source of regret than anything else. Other things have taken up residence in these places, known or otherwise, that can aid the Iron Kingdom somewhat, or threaten them even more. And let us not forget that empire in the east, past the Bloodstone Desert that long has had designs of its own and has been acting on them of late. 
thanks to this and many other things, war is such a petty thing these days. And now, now the infernals have come knocking, for they are here to claim and collect what they've been promised. Welcome to the Iron Kingdoms, pitiful soul.